Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. If you're interested in these programs, you can join our membership by going to preservelincoln.org. Our videotape today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Our speaker today is Richard Schmeling. Richard is the founder and director of ProRail Nebraska. He also is the founder of Citizens for Improved Transit. Richard has authored and co-authored books about railroad history and has authored a number of articles about railroading, railroading which has appeared in nationally circulated railroad magazines. Schmeling's photographs have also appeared in over 30 railroad books authored by others. Richard's talk today is titled Early Passenger Service. Please join me in welcoming Richard. Well, I am absolutely astounded that so many people came out on a cold day to, to hear this, uh, this talk. And uh, the last time I did one of these, I was afraid that nobody would come. And so I really bent the arms of a bunch of my friends and said, uh, you know, you have to come because there's not going to be anybody there. And I was amazed because the room was very full. Uh, this time I didn't twist any arms and we're about half full. So uh, it's been kind of fun for me to watch you as you arrive. Uh, some of you I know, uh, some of you I got acquainted with today. And uh, uh, Mike Jess, uh, who, who was in a melodrama with me, was a natural villain. He played it to the hilt. And we had a lot of fun with that one. Uh, but uh, we did that, I think, down in the basement of the old uh, uh, downtown Holiday Inn. And uh, the word was you could throw popcorn at the villain and you could throw paper cups at the villain. But some lady got a little bit overly enthusiastic and a little intoxicated. She threw a plastic pitcher up on the stage. <laughs> and that was kind of scary. Um, well, you know, this time is going to go by so very, very fast, and I can't tell you everything I know about railroads in an hour's time, so I'm not even going to attempt to do that. The title of the presentation today is Early Passenger Trains, but in order to really understand kind of what's going on with early passenger trains, we have to kind of go back to the beginning of railroading. and. Um, how did, how did this happen? You know, why, why do we have railroads? Well, of course, the, the key event that triggered the start and growth of railroads was the steam locomotive. And the early applications for the steam locomotive were stationary uh, engines, and they powered conveyor belts at mines. Uh, they were used to generate electricity and, and so on. And somebody said, you know, I bet we could really maybe expand the use of these things. And what we could do is we, maybe we could have one of them pull some things and move some things. So the very earliest railroads, interestingly enough, were coal mine railroads in England. And uh, instead of having rails, what they did was they had stone roadways and they cut grooves in the roadway and then the wheels would follow the grooves and so that's the way the train steered itself down the track. And that was that was very early railroading. Um, as time went along somebody said well you know <laughs> we have to keep scooping the mud out of these grooves and sometimes uh, the train jumps the track so what we're going to do is let's try something different. So the early rails that were used were wooden rails. And that didn't work too well because the wood would wear over a period of time and you were constantly having to change the rails. So we went from there to a wooden rail with a metal strap nailed on the top. That worked a little better but there were some problems because as the train went down the track, it would work the nails loose 
and that strap would come loose and it had a natural coil to it and that coil would come up through the bottom of a passenger car and that was not good. So we went from that particular idea to iron rails. Iron rails were, were the, in the early railroads were used extensively. And then we got to the point where we could take iron and we could make steel out of it. And so then the rail became steel. Uh, and that's kind of where we are today with our railroads. We have steel rail. In the United States, we have what is called standard gauge railroads for the most part. Standard gauge railroads means that there's exactly four feet, eight and a half inches between the inside of the rails. Well, that's kind of a strange thing. Why four feet, eight and a half? That's because the carts, the wagons that they used on the first railroads had wheels spaced four feet, eight and a half inches apart. And so that's, that's kind of by accident, that's where we ended up with standard gauge. Now, uh, just a show of hands, how many of you have ridden the narrow gauge out in Colorado? The, oh yeah, everybody, pretty much. Okay, that's narrow gauge. That is 36 inches from inside of rail to inside of rail. The reason those were used was they were cheaper to construct and when you wanted to run the railroad track along the side of a mountain, you only had to have a narrow ledge blasted off the side of the mountain instead of a big one. So we have the narrow gauge. Um, not common in the United States, but common throughout the rest of the world is meter gauge, meter gauge. So that would be one meter between the rails. Okay, anybody remember what a, a meter is, how many inches? 30, the, the, the answer is 39.6 inches. So that's your meter gauge. The Russians were paranoid because they were always getting, getting invaded. You know, Napoleon came in there and, uh, and invaded Russia. And uh, so what they did, they decided they'd, they'd make it easier to defend the country. So they essentially went to what's called broad gauge, which was wider than any of the other European railroads. So when the Germans, when the Nazis invaded Russia, what they had to do was when they got to the east end of Poland, they'd have to take the freight car bodies off the four feet eight and a half and put them on a set of trucks that were, I think, I think five feet, 60 inches. And, and that's cumbersome but it kind of served the purpose, it slowed the Germans down just a little bit. Um, so our, our early steam engines uh, were pretty primitive. Uh, many of the early engines had boilers that were upright instead of horizontal. And uh, uh, then as time went along and we refined things, we went from the horizontal boilers to, uh, or from the vertical boilers to the horizontal boilers. And I'm going to take just a moment and show you a picture of a very early English steam engine. This is an engine called the Northumberland. And the Northumberland is a very pretty engine as were many of the engines both in the United States and in England. Uh, the British had a tendency to paint up most of their engines, make them very pretty. And uh, the Northumberland is a, a good example of that. Uh, the early steam engines tended to have fewer wheels than later steam engines. So I'm going to go ahead and segue from this picture of the Northumberland to a quick discussion, if I may, about steam locomotives and how we classify them. The system that we use to classify steam locomotives is called the White system. Not W-H-I-T-E, but 
W-H-Y-T-E, okay? And that system is generally what's used here in the United States. In the, uh, on the continent, in England, there's a continental system, and that is slightly different. And I'll try to explain the difference to you fairly simply, but let's talk about the white system. On steam engines, you've got a long frame. At the very front of the engine, you may or may not have idler wheels that don't do any work. They're just there to go along the track. Then you have a set of wheels that are called driving wheels or drivers. And then as the engines grew, we had another set of wheels that were idler type wheels that would support the weight of the back of the engine and the firebox. And those were called trailer wheels. So let's start with some of the early engines, like our Northumbrian that we saw a picture of. It has no idler wheels in the front. It has one driver on each side. Under the white system, what you do is you double the number of axles. So zero for the idler wheels, one driver on each side, two, and then there were some trailing, there was a set of trailing wheels, and that was one set of trailing wheels. So we get a classification of O-2-2. And I have a limited number of handouts, which I will g let you share, that talks about these wheel arrangements, and perhaps you can pass them around. I wish I had one for everybody, but my budget for this uh, particular presentation was pretty low, uh, and my compensation is even lower. So, um, so what was happening was, uh, and, oh, and the passenger cars, the early passenger cars. What did we use for that? Well, uh, what was in use in England prior to the railroads were stagecoaches. And they're very, they were very similar to the stagecoaches that we see in our Western movies as we, you know, uh, have the horses and we gallop across the, the prairie. So in England, the early passenger cars were stagecoaches with railroad wheels. And that practice carried over into the United States. So in early American railroading, we would have a series of passenger cars that looked like stagecoaches. Then as time went along, uh, somebody said, I, I think I can better invent a better mousetrap. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and make a longer passenger car. The evolution then was that we had some longer passenger cars that were made all of wood. Um, that created some problems because we, we had, uh, uh, you know, the usual rot, wear, tear, and so on with the wood. So at some point in time, we started making our passenger cars with a metal frame, but the sides and the roof were wood. Now, these cars were fairly lightweight, so smaller engines could pull those cars fairly easily. But there's a problem with having a passenger car made totally or partially out of wood. Anybody got any idea what that problem is? Fire. Yes. So what would happen is they would have a derailment or a head-on collision, and these passenger cars would splinter, and then how were the cars heated? With a stove, a coal stove or a wood stove. And what would happen is all that stuff would spill out of that stove from the force of the collision, and then the wooden passenger car would catch fire, oftentimes roasting the people who were trapped inside. Um, there was a PAL presentation that was very interesting some time ago where a gentleman who had written the book about the Rock Island derailment uh, down toward uh, uh, Wilderness Park. And in that particular derailment, the passenger equipment was wood and it splintered and, and uh, 
I think one of the crewmen was a hero and rescued another crewman because the car was burning. So what then we did, we went from the wooden car bodies to an all steel car body. And that was much safer, it was more collision resistant, and it didn't catch fire. But what it did was it made the cars heavier. So these little tea kettle engines that we started out with, like the Northumberland and the, uh, uh, the smaller designs, uh, those suddenly couldn't pull enough cars. So then we started lengthening and making bigger the steam locomotives. Uh, a, uh, an early American engine was called the Best Friend of Charleston, and it was 040 wheel arrangement. No idlers, total of four driving wheels, no trailing trucks. Why would we want some idlers on the front of an engine? Well, what we found out was that the Best Friend of Charleston, which operated at a fairly slow speed, uh, tracked pretty well, but when those engines started going a little faster, they had a tendency to what we call hunt, that's a move back and forth on the rails, and even to the point where they would derail. And so some bright mechanical engineer discovered that what he could do is put some idler wheels there that were connected with the frame of the engine, and that would help guide the train down the track and especially when the train went around curves. So then we started getting some uh, different configurations. But there were a lot of engines that had four idler wheels, two on each side, four idler wheels. Uh, the 440 was a very popular and wide, widely used type of engine. It was called the Atlantic. Then we decided we need a little bigger engine, so we had the 460. Four idler wheels, six driving wheels, no trailing wheels. Anybody know of a 460 that might be around the Lincoln area? Down at the depot. 710, 710. And 710 is historically significant because our Havelock shops, which now only repair freight cars, actually built steam locomotives. That engine, the 710, was built in Havelock. As bigger engines came along, that little 460 couldn't pull the big heavy steel passenger cars, but the Burlington was great on saving money. So what they did was they took the engine, they rebuilt it, and made it into a branch line freight engine. So the engine you see on display at Iron Horse Park is modified. And what they did, the passenger engines, the 440s were very, very fast. They tended to have very tall driving wheels, sometimes as much as 77 inches or 80 inches. The 460s, before they were rebuilt, had fairly large wheels so they could go fast, but the 710, as it ended up, ended up with much smaller driving wheels, so it didn't need to go as fast because it was being used on branch lines and they don't go as fast on the branch lines. Um, and uh, all of these wheel types have a corresponding name. So for example, a 462, on a railroad was called a Pacific type. Uh, there were some engines that were 282 design and they were called Mikados. The reason was that the first of the 282s were built for the Japanese railways. And then World War II came along and all of a sudden people got all upset because we had a steam engine with a Japanese name. So on the Union Pacific Railroad, we changed the name of that type of engine to MacArthur. MacArthur, <laughs> very appropriate. We give it an American type name. Um, then uh, we had some engines that were uh, two idler wheels, 
uh, six driving wheels, two trailing wheels, those were called prairie engines. Prairie engines work real well in Nebraska, Kansas, and the level parts of the country. Uh, Burlington, that ran through Lincoln, Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy had a bunch of those 262s. Uh, my hometown of Superior, Nebraska is the only town where the Santa Fe came into Nebraska. They used almost exclusively 262s on that line. Other railroads had a tendency to use a different design, which was called a 280. That would be two idler wheels, four driving wheels on each side, and no trailing wheels. And uh, Union Pacific, a lot of their branch line engines in Nebraska were 280s. Um, they used those throughout the system. Other railroads would use the 280 wheel arrangement. Um, but you got to be a little bit careful because what happens is some railroads don't want to have the same name for that type of wheel arrangement as other railroads. So like New York Central was notorious for calling a certain arrangement of wheels on its railroad by a different name than the other railroads. So you, you need to kind of be aware that that sort of thing is going on. Um, so the engines kept getting bigger and bigger, the passenger cars longer, heavier, and finally we got to the point where we needed some pretty big steam engines to pull those passenger trains. So the evolution went along, so we had some 482 steam engines that were called mountains, unless you were on the New York Central and then they were called Niagara's. And uh, uh, then you had some 484s. The 484s were called Northerns, except on some railroads that had their own name for that particular wheel arrangement. Um, I am not in the book selling business. I am not in the habit of urging people to buy books other than my book, which is on sale in the gift shop, America's Shortest Interstate Railroad, and the book I co-authored called Trains of Lincoln Station. Both those books are out there, and if you don't have them, you might want to pick them up. Uh, but what you will have a tendency to find is when you go to Barnes & Noble or Francie & Finch or any of the bookstores, you'll find what I call pop railroad books. These books are a type of book that is uh, very popular. Uh, they print thousands of them and uh, millions of them, I suppose. And you'll find those at the bookstores that don't specialize in railroad type books. Uh, and this one, I don't have time to leaf through it all the way. There are beautiful color illustrations of steam engines in here. And they run all the way from the early British steam engines to the diesels, the modern day diesels. So uh, if you have a friend that's interested in railroads and you're looking for a Christmas present, pick up one of these. And, and this isn't the only one, there are, there are a bunch of them. Um, now, we're going along and we're, we're getting the, the big steam engines, and uh, even the big steam engines are, are sorely taxed to pull those passenger cars that are made out of all steel. Those passenger cars are commonly referred to as heavyweight cars, heavyweight, okay? So somebody, a fellow by the name of Mr. Bud, uh, had an idea. He said, I can lighten the weight of those passenger cars. What I'll do is I'll use a steel frame, but I'll use aluminum siding and aluminum roof. So we started getting some what we call streamlined passenger trains. And Lincoln had the Pioneer Zephyr that ran out of here until it went to the Chicago Railroad Museum. Uh, we had a, a couple of sets of Nebraska Zephyr trains, and uh, then there were uh, there were some 
morning and afternoon Zephyrs that went from Chicago up to the Twin Cities. Uh, Union Pacific called their train streamliners. They had the first one was called the M10,000. It was not the first diesel streamliner because it burned gasoline distillate. The actual first diesel powered streamliner was the Burlington's Pioneer Zephyr. Pretty soon all the railroads, practically all the railroads that amounted to anything had uh, these streamlined passenger trains. Now some of the steam engines that had been fairly built fairly late in the system were still good haulers and it seemed like kind of a waste you know to have those wonderful engines but the public was <coughs> demanding the uh, the streamlined trains. So what happened on some railroads was we went ahead and we shrouded the steam locomotives and made them look sort of like the passenger diesels. And I've got a couple of examples here. This is a Southern Pacific engine. It is a 484 wheel arrangement. And the passenger train that you see is painted in something called daylight colors. Very beautiful train. And uh, the, uh, the Rock Island, Rocky Mountain rocket that came through Lincoln uh, was uh, stainless steel. It was silver. Most of the Burlington Zephyrs were silver, stainless steel. Union Pacific streamliners were yellow. And we had the Southern Railroad, and those passenger trains were a beautiful shade of green. And Baltimore and Ohio, uh, their trains were a blue. Um, and the railroads really worked hard to try to outdo each other so that they would have the neatest train that would attract the most riders. Another example of a steam engine that has been kind of worked over is this one. And this is an engine that was originally part of the Reading Railroad, but has been sort of loaned to the Chesapeake and Ohio, the Chessie system. And it is not totally streamlined like the, the Southern Pacific engine. It is semi-streamlined. It has some trim to, to make it look a little more attractive. Um, some engines uh, had a problem with what we call smoke when, uh, when they drifted. That's when they weren't under power and there wasn't exhaust forcing the smoke up uh, through the smokestack and up high into the air. So some railroads did uh, a, a thing uh, called elephant ears. And those look like elephant ears. They're on the front of the engine. They change the airflow. So even when the engine is drifting, the uh, exhaust and smoke and so on go upward instead of along the boiler and blinding the crews. So uh, Delaware and Hudson had some elephant ears. Uh, Union Pacific had elephant ears on his 484s and some of his 4664s. A lot of railroads did that. Um, visibility could be a problem with the steam engine. And uh, if you stop and think about it, you've got your engineer looking down a long boiler. And it's going to be hard for him to see a car crossing from the other side of, of his engine. So the Southern Pacific uh, had an innovation, and what they did was they got, they just turned the engine around so that the cab was on the front, and then where it hooked to the tender, uh, that was the old front of the engine. Those were called cab forward engines, and they're, they're a very neat engine to see. Uh, Southern Pacific was probably about the only railroad that, that did that extensively. Um, now, as the engines got bigger and bigger, then we get into a problem. 
because the wheelbase is rigid and you're going to have to go around some fairly tight curves. And the engines were getting so long that it was hard to go around the curves. Union Pacific had the longest rigid wheel arrangement. And I didn't put it up here, but it's, it's interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of put it up here at the top. It had some engines that the wheel arrangement was 4 12 2. So you'd have six drivers that were basically rigid along the side of the engine and uh, on each side. Those engines straightened out a lot of curves on the Union Pacific and they couldn't go on the on the sidings. Those engines were basically mainline engines. Another development in steam locomotives had to do with, with this problem of going around the curves. And so Anatole Malle, I guess a Swiss or Frenchman or something, he had an idea. He said, what I'll do is I'll put two separate engines together and I'll put a hinge in the center so they'll go around curves better. So then we started getting what we call articulated engines. Those are engines that bend in the middle. Uh, Omaha is going to get a new bus rapid transit system and they're going to have articulated buses that bend in the middle. So we've, you know, we've adapted some new ideas to transportation. The world's largest steam locomotive was owned by Union Pacific and we have a picture of it up here on the wall. Its wheel arrangement was four, eight, eight, four. It is huge. Now, I mentioned tender. Usually the, the fuel and the water for steam engines was carried in a separate car called a tender. And uh, I saw a bumper sticker, it was kind of cute, it was some rail fan, and the bumper sticker said, steam engines have a tender behind. <laughs> I like that. Uh, it was a good bumper sticker. Um, the steam engine tenders had varying wheel arrangements. The Union Pacific Big Boy had uh, a, a, a couple of swiveling wheels at the front of the tender and then a series of rigid wheels on the back. And that gave them fits when they tried to turn that engine on a, a Y track with a, with a, a sharp curve radiator. And uh, uh, I remember seeing them try to turn one of the centipede tendered engines uh, on a fan trip on a, a Y that wasn't built to accommodate it. And there was a railroader walking along each side of the engine watching to see if those tender wheels were going to climb off and derail and then give a signal if indeed there was a problem. Um, you, there were 25 Union Pacific big boys. The first of them came about 1942, shortly after the declaration of World War II, and then an additional set of those engines uh, came in about 1944. There were a total of 25 of them built. They were so unique that uh, 12 of the 24, or the, 12 of the 25 were saved. Many of them went to railroad museums. And I thought, okay, you know, this is kind of neat. You can go to the railroad museum, you can see Union Pacific Big Boy, but it's not the same as actually seeing it fired up and running out on the railroad. Oh well, you know, they're gone. They'll never return. Surprise. Union Pacific negotiated with a railroad museum in California, took back one of the big boys, the 4014, spent two years totally refurbishing it, and this summer it went to the 150th anniversary of the driving of the Golden Spike in, in Ogden, Utah. And then it came across Nebraska, 
It went through Iowa, up into Minnesota, uh, up into Michigan. And this is a picture of the big boy over in Iowa, and it's crossing a bridge. And uh, it's, it's uh, on something that is called the Grassy Point Drawbridge. Uh, actually, it's a, uh, instead of a drawbridge, which raises a section up, is a swing span, which puts a section of the bridge sideways. But that is, um, that is up in uh, uh, between Superior, Wisconsin, and Duluth, Minnesota. Um, and uh, the Iron Range. Yes, the Iron Range, yes. And they had some of the articulated engines because that iron ore is tremendously heavy and they needed big engines to haul that. So they had not four 884s, but they had some two 884s and some four 664s. Six so we've, we've covered a lot of territory. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've kind of ranged a little bit far from the early passenger trains. Uh, I will just simply say this, that today, there is a passenger train renaissance in the United States. It's happening all over the world. When I was in the Army in Vietnam, I went on r and to Tokyo and Japan. Mm -hmm. I rode the bullet train from Tokyo to Osaka. Those trains go 200, 210 miles an hour. And they're smooth. Uh, and the only sensation I had of speed was watching the poles that hold the overhead wire up go bing, 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 bing. Uh, China is big into that. They're building high-speed railroads all over China. France has high-speed trains. Italy, Spain, uh, uh, all over the world except here in the United States. And here in the United States, Lincoln, the capital city, has exactly two trains through it every 24 hours, the California Zephyr trains, and they come through in the middle of the night. One of the things that ProRail Nebraska is advocating for is for Amtrak to put on a second pair of trains from Chicago to Denver, have them come through during the daytime, uh -huh. yeah. would be really more convenient for the riders. The other thing we're advocating for is we're advocating for commuter trains between Lincoln and Omaha. They're doing a survey for bus commuter service, and as far as I'm concerned, we're looking at the wrong thing. We need to be having trains because trains are the all-weather mode. Even when you have heavy snowstorms, the trains may run late, but they eventually get through. When the interstate is closed, the airports are, are, have the planes grounded, the trains get through. Um, the uh, numbers that we're looking at is it's estimated that there are 24,000 daily trips between Lincoln and Omaha each day, 24,000. And if you have passenger trains that have a capacity of 200, why? If you capture only a small percent of the people that are driving their cars, you're filling the trains. So anyway, uh, if any of you have any connections with Kyle Schneeweiss, the director of the Department of Transportation of the state of Nebraska, call him up or write him and tell him he needs to look at rail commuter service as well as bus commuter service. Um, the Omaha is, of course, looking at uh, a streetcar system that would be basically in the downtown area. I mentioned the articulated buses. The Omaha bus system is putting in what's called bus rapid transit, and that's going to be along Dodge Street from West Road Shopping Center all the way downtown. And that's why they need the hinged buses, because they're going to be turning some tight corners downtown. Totally different type of bus service. Instead of stopping every four or five or six blocks, you're going to go about a mile between stops. And so that speeds up the, the travel time. Uh, in addition, uh, we have technology called AVL, Automatic Vehicle Locator, uh, 
That's tied into some great god computer up in the sky somewhere, and that's also tied in with the traffic signals. And that computer will sense when one of those rapid transit buses is falling behind schedule and keep the signal green for it to go through the next intersection so it can get back on schedule. Just the technology, the, the changes that we're seeing are just absolutely amazing. Lincoln is getting battery electric buses. And to me, again, that's just mind boggling because, you know, batteries moving a great big bus, uh, you know, you'd think they, it wouldn't, the charge wouldn't last long enough. But the buses we're going to get are going to be good for eight to nine hours of service between charge. And uh, uh, we have other interesting things taking place in transportation. Um, but what's happening is we're rediscovering rail. We're realizing that as a country, we can no longer afford to have cars running around towns or on the interstate with an average of only 1.2 two people per vehicle. That's wasteful. It's polluting. It's something that we've allowed to happen and we need to take steps to change things. Um, I'm, I'm preaching. I'm advocating because I believe strongly in this and I'm seeing some changes uh, that are taking place. Interestingly enough, in Kansas City last week, the Kansas City City Council voted 13 to nothing to make their entire bus system no fare. Everybody's going to ride for nothing. We should do that in Lincoln. The reason we need to do that is that uh, in a time of tight employment, you know, employers are screaming for workers, and uh, uh, part of the reason some people aren't able to take jobs is they, they can't get there. Then we have, you know, some people that even the $8 a month senior low income bus pass is too big a strain on their budget. And uh, this would allow low income people to, uh, to go seek jobs, to work at jobs, to go to medical appointments, uh, to go and get groceries, to go visit Aunt Nellie on the other side of town. It's, it's a great social equalizer. And uh, uh, I have been talking to Mayor Larian about it. Uh, we're kind of sharpening the pencil and looking at the numbers, but StarTran only gets 8% of its operating uh, expense from the fare box. And the transit manager tells me that he's willing to sacrifice that 8% because it would eliminate a lot of hassle and expense. So stay tuned, we may see it happen. I am within a few minutes for, uh, from having to wrap up. We've got about 10 minutes left. I could talk about this all day and bore you, but I could talk all day and maybe not answer questions that you might have. So at this point, I'm going to open it up. If somebody has a question, don't be shy. Lita. Cornhusker on 33rd Street, where the train keeps going and going and going, and there's only one or two engineers. Now they're talking about the one engineer on a train that may be carrying 100 cars. What do you think about that? I think, we're, I think we've paired our crews to the point where we can't pair another person. Uh, I, one of my, my post-retirement jobs uh, was that I drove railroad crews for Burlington Northern Santa Fe out of the yard. I got to know a lot of those railroaders and they said that from an alertness factor, you need somebody else in the cab of that engine to keep you from falling asleep. Uh, oh yes. and. Uh, and the question was, the question we just answered is, they're proposing to uh, decrease the number of crewmen in the cab of the, of the freight trains from two to one. And what's, what's my opinion about that? And you just heard it. Anybody else got any questions?
Well, somebody else must have. Yes. You didn't mention the fact that uh, years ago uh, there used to be a train service between Omaha and Lincoln for home football games because I remember people getting off the train across the street from the west side of the stadium. The, the comment was we used to have uh, football specials that ran from Omaha to Lincoln. And during the days before Amtrak, we would sometimes have as many as six or eight of those passenger trains running by Burlington. Uh, in later years, uh, after Amtrak came on, it was one big long train. Um, there's no reason why we shouldn't or couldn't be doing that again. And uh, uh, if we get the commuter rail between Lincoln and Omaha, then on football Saturdays, we take every piece of equipment that's runnable and we shuttle back and forth. How much more pleasant would it be to come to a game if you live in Omaha riding the train? And remember, they stopped the train right north of Memorial Stadium and you walked right to the stadium. Just across the street. Yep, that's right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What, what was the, I'm sorry. What are the top tourist trains? Top tourist trains. Okay, the question is, what are the top tourist trains in the United States? Um, Cumbus and Toltec would be up on the top of the list. What? Cumbus and Toltec. That's a narrow gauge line uh, that runs from... Uh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm having a senior moment here. It runs from Anonito, Colorado, uh, over to a town. Leadville, maybe? No, 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 no. Uh, Chama, Chama, C-H-A-M-A, -A, Mexico. And they use, they use the same steam engines and the same type of equipment. Then Durango to Silverton is another narrow gauge operation. It gets a lot of patronage. Um, in Pennsylvania, there's a railroad that runs through the Amish country. It's called the Strasburg Railroad. And it has steam engines, and uh, it, it gets a lot of patronage. Um, they're scattered all over the country. Uh, there's some need operations. Uh, uh, we used to have, you know, we used to have the Fremont dinner train, and, and we used to have a steam engine on that. And that's gone, but that dinner train is running down in Baldwin, Kansas. The engine and cars and everything went down to Baldwin. Um, and um, in addition to the tourist railroads, why uh, the major railroads, many of them will go ahead and run what we call rail fan excursions. Like the Union Pacific Big Boy, you could buy a ticket and ride that train from Omaha through Iowa and, and have the thrill of riding behind the world's biggest steam engine. A uh, lot of different ones. And there is a, a tourist railroad guide, and uh, I think you can probably Google and find that, and you'll be surprised. They're just all over. Anybody else? Questions? Yes, sir. How much did the big boy weigh, and how many years were they in service? Oh, boy, now you're going to tax me. The question is, how much did the big boy weigh, and how many years were they in service? I'll handle the easy one first. The first of the big boys were delivered in 42, 1942. The big boys were last used on a regular basis in about 1958. And at that point, they had enough diesel engines that they essentially put them out to pasture. How much do they weigh? Oh my. Okay. Let's, let's start by saying that the tender alone holds about 21 or 22 tons of coal. Then you've got all that massive weight of the boiler and, and you have the, the big wheels, uh, the driving rods. Uh, you have a, a whole bunch of things. I I know I have seen those figures somewhere. I don't have them with me, but we're talking huge, gigantic, which is why 
the size of rail has had to increase as we use the bigger engines. It used to be that we had a lot of rail lines in Nebraska that were 60 pounds. 60 pounds means a foot of rail is 60 pounds. Today, mainline rail is up around the 100, 139, 141, 150 pound range. Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir. Is there anything to the story that in the late 50s, uh, Union Pacific wanted to continue using steam engines, but the diesel manufacturers talked them out of it? That was on public radio. Okay. Okay, the question was, did Union Pacific want to continue using steam engines in the 1950s, about mid-50s on, but the diesel manufacturers talked them out of it? Uh, I think not, okay? What, what we need to remember is that steam locomotives uh, were very labor-intensive. Uh, they would go about 100, 120 miles, then you had to take them off the train, you had to take them to the roundhouse, and all these roundhouse guys would have to clean the fire uh, and lubricate them and so on. And uh, the diesels, you know, could run basically Omaha to Los Angeles, Omaha to Portland. About all you had to do is put a little sand on them and, and, and uh, put some fuel in them. So, it's a good story that I've spread it around, so I better be careful. <laughs> I, I will tell you this, that I lived through that era, and uh, uh, what was happening was the Union Pacific had enough diesels that they would be fully dieselized from about January through April or May. Then business picked up again, and they had all these steam engines that were in what we call storage, and then they'd start pulling those engines out and use them again. And they would use those. They used them kind of like what we would call a surge fleet to, to handle uh, bursts in business. And Union Pacific, interestingly enough, had a plan that they were going to save all 25 of the big boys, all 100 and some of the Challenger engines, all of the 484 Northerns and about 12 of those crazy 4122s and they were going to keep them in operating condition, have them in storage and use them as a surge fleet. That just didn't happen. And I, I, think, I think the problem was that, that with the steam engine, remember what you had to do, the early engines were fueled with wood and that was kind of cumbersome. Then we went to coal and some railroads used oil. But all of these things require fueling facilities. And with the coal burners, you had big, tall coaling towers. And uh, uh, if you had diesels, you know, all you needed was the, the hose and the nozzle. And so the railroad looked at it and said, do we want to go to the expense of maintaining these coaling towers to run a few steam engines three or four months a year? And the answer was probably doesn't make any sense. So, goodbye, UP Steam. Yes, sir. Uh, we've got about five minutes left, and that's time for just a few more. Yes, sir. Uh, I heard a top engineer at the Roads Department give a talk a few years ago, and I asked him any regrets about the interstate, and he said he, they regretted, or he regretted they didn't widen the interstate so they could put rail down the center. Was there any discussion at that time when they built the interstate to or rail? Um, the question is, when Interstate 80 was, was built between Lincoln and Omaha, uh, the en one of the engineers that helped design it and uh, supervise the construction regrets that they didn't design it in such a way that they could put a rail line down the center median. Uh, Doug, I, I think the answer is this. I thought about the same thing. I thought, That'd be a great place for a rail line. The problem is that the curves on the interstate are not compatible with rail. They're too sharp. And, and kind of think as you drive that. You know, there's some pretty, pretty sharp curves. So, uh, yeah, the guy probably regretted it. But 
we've already got a, a railroad line that we can use. The Burlington Northern Santa Fe from downtown Lincoln to downtown Omaha. It's, uh, it is 79 mile an hour track. It carries the Amtrak trains and it's signaled for positive train control, which was the latest in, in traffic safety. So uh, probably the interstate isn't a good idea. <laughs> yes, sir, behind you. What about the future of coal trains? There's talk that the, the power plants are cutting back on coal. And OK, all right. Okay, I'm on the uh, mayor's, uh, the question is, what about these coal trains? Do we, uh, do we want to, you know, encourage those long coal trains? Do we want to keep burning coal to generate electricity? I'm on the mayor's Lincoln Environmental Action Program Task Force, and we've been talking about things like that. Um, first of all, Okay, uh, and I need to wrap this up very quickly, but first of all, let me just say that uh, the, uh, most of the, the Nebraska coal generating plants have, have scrubbers and filters to get most of the bad stuff out of it. Uh, with the change in fuel for power generation, for the first time in history, automobiles cause more air pollution than power generation. It's over 50%, Man, that just switched in the last couple of years. So I think that's all we have time for. Uh, gee, people, it's been wonderful. If any of you want to stay and talk with me, uh, I'll be glad to visit with you for a few minutes. And uh, uh, we'll do it again soon. Uh, there's a lot to talk about with railroading. We'll never exhaust the subject. And uh, I, there's nothing I like better than to talk about trains. So thank you.